Hi everyone, welcome to Adult Bible Studies. Uh, this is a series of Bible lessons being taught based on the Cokesbury Adult Bible Studies material. And this week, we're looking at the fourth lesson in a unit of lessons with the title of Show and Tell. I like show and tell. You know, I, it's something that the teachers didn't do when I was in school, but it's something that I can see would be very uh, invigorating and very spontaneous, something that the kids can do spontaneously without having to uh, worry so much about what they were going to say and how they were going to say it, but just simply sharing about something that they uh, like. And uh, it's a great teaching tool. Well, it's not only a great teaching tool in school, it's a great teaching tool in life. For as we show, as well as tell, uh, we are able to communicate much more effectively with other people. The good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. We began this unit by looking at uh, the greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. We saw how in those commandments and in that element of love is one of the ways that we as Christian people show the world, not just tell the world, but show the world that God's love is powerful, it's life-changing, it's life-sustaining, and it's uh, a perfect way of showing and telling others about our Lord Jesus Christ and about God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Next week, The next week we looked at the subject of light, and we saw how light is such a good depiction of God, because light is pure. Uh, pure white light just pushes out all around it. It can dispel the darkness, and darkness is really something that we cringe about as human beings. It's something we don't have a lot of control over. We see death as dark and gloomy. We see bad things as dark and gloomy. Uh, the good cowboys wore white hats. The bad cowboys wore black hats. <laughs> uh, but light, that light uh, and the way it illuminates and uh, enriches uh, is a way that we think about God. And it's a way of showing and telling others about God. Uh, last week, we looked at the idea of how uh, from James, James talks to us about some very fundamental uh, kind of things about just being real as Christian people. And he says, you can't expect people to just hear your words and respond based on your testimony. They need to see your testimony. Remember the little uh, saying, uh, I'd rather see a sermon any day than to hear one preached. It doesn't mean that it's not good to hear a good preached sermon, but that sermon has to be substantiated in the life of the person who's sharing those words. And when it is, then it really has a powerful impact. Well, like I said, today we're going to look at the last installment in this unit of show and tell. And very rightfully so, we're looking at probably the uh, absolute best topic here when it comes to the idea of showing and telling the Great Commission. For we see Jesus showing and telling. We see him using this method to speak to his disciples. And we see him encouraging us to do the same as we seek to share his love and grace in our world around us. We're going to look today at Matthew, the 28th chapter, uh, beginning with verse 16. Now, Matthew is unique in the sense that he limits his post resurrection accounts of Jesus to just two accounts. The two Marys as they go to the tomb and encounter Jesus and the 11 disciples when they respond to Jesus's command to gather on a mountainside and there he uh, comes to greet them and to commission them and send them forth. 20 verses. In the other gospels there's a lot more than that to Jesus' post-resurrection. We're told that there were many times that he presented himself to the uh, to the people and to the disciples and that, uh, you know, the day of Pentecost and all the things that happened uh, as Jesus 
uh, transcended this world and uh, took his throne in heaven. But today we're going to think about this great commission. First of all, uh, Mary, the two Marys, saw Jesus, went to the tomb and saw Jesus, and uh, Jesus greets them and gives them the, gives them a commission to go and tell the eleven disciples, the remaining eleven, uh, that he will be with them in Galilee. He says, "Go ahead." And tell them to gather in Galilee. Galilee is a significant place because that's where Jesus began his ministry. It's also a place where Jew and Gentile influence was uh, mixed together. And in this Great Commission, what we see is that Jesus is dropping uh, away that sense of the gospel, the good news being just for the Jews, and understanding now that it's all people that God loves and that God is extending his love and his grace and his mercy to everyone. So go into Galilee and there I'll appear to you again. And that's what we find here in verse 16 is Jesus's encounter with these disciples. It says here in verse 16, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go doesn't say which mountain, what mountain, or what situation. It just says Jesus had uh, commissioned them to go, and they went. Uh, Matthew left out the part of the conversation where he had more clearly identified uh, the mountain, so we don't know exactly where that took place, and it's not that important that we would know exactly the place, but we know that Jesus intentionally called his disciples together. He used Mary, the two Marys, to uh, commit to uh, take that message to the others to show and to tell, to say, you know, we have seen Jesus. And he says to go on into Galilee and he will meet us there. And that's what happens here. The 11 disciples went up onto that mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Verse 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. When they saw him, they were overwhelmed. In Matthew's account, this is their first post-resurrection experience with Jesus. It's their first encounter with him. When they saw him, can you imagine the range of emotions and, and uh, that went through them as they realized that yes, he has risen. Yes, he is alive. Yes, he is all that he said he was and can be. Just think of the release from that. Think of how, how questioning and how hesitant they had been trying to put together all the things that Jesus had taught them and how they were riding that wave of public uh, influence and has growing influence with the people and the people's love and grace and then all of a sudden it to be cut short and for him to them to stand and watch him be crucified death indicating in our world and in, in our sense of the world the end and yet for them there was that still that hope that seed that they were anticipating more but they didn't know exactly what more and they didn't dare guess what more but here is Jesus and he is alive and suddenly a lot of those fears dissipate and fall away it's kind of like when you let your teenager drive on their own for the first time <laughs> remember that experience if you've had teenagers well you probably didn't relax while they were gone on that trip, whether it was just to the corner store and back or not. But when they came home and they smiled and they said, thank you so much for letting me go. It was like a burden had been lifted. You crossed that threshold into acknowledging them as a driver. Well, here we've crossed a threshold into knowing that Jesus is alive and that he is there with them 
and by his presence he comforts them. Also, by his words, he guides them. I'm in the midst of reading a really good book right now called Intentional Living. It's written by John Maxwell. John is a pastor and a leader, a leadership expert, one who does all kinds of uh, workshops and things like that for business people, for people in leadership positions and those types of things. And he mingles his ministry, his Christian ministry in with these philosophies and principles of leadership and guiding other people, mentoring other people. And he does it in a beautiful way that shows how Christianity can interact with the world and both can benefit from it. And I like this. But he talks about intentional living. And he says to be intentional is to have a clear sense of who you are, where you are, and where you're headed toward. That's just plain common sense, isn't it? And yet, think of how many times people in our world, myself included, we just strike out and hope for the best. There's a need to be intentional. And to be intentional, you have to take some time to stop for a moment and think it through. How can I do this? What resources do I have? Is this something I'm good at? Do I need to enlist someone else to work with me because I'm not that good at some of the things that are going to be real important to this task? All those things are part of that intentionality. Jesus was aware that his disciples, their heads were spinning. They were unsure what to do. They had never encountered any situation in past history or in their personal lives that would prepare them and enable them to see clearly in this moment of such great change. And so Jesus gives them that insight that they need. He shows them by his presence that it's not over. And he tells them, there's that theme, show and tell again. He tells them what is to be for them the focal point of their ministry. Go and make disciples. He commissions them. He says, I know you probably have a, lot, a million things in your mind that you've heard me say and seen me do and know are important to me. And you're thinking about all the things that you could do, would do, may be able to do, and but you're just not sure which direction to go in. And so he gives them direction. I want you to understand that one of the dominating principles of your life and your ministry and your actions is to be to think on this commission. Jesus begins, first of all, by acknowledging the fact that he has the authority now to commission them. You know, when he sent them out uh, prior to his death, and to minister on their own for the first time, he gave them power. He gave them power to preach, gave them power to teach, gave them power, power to heal, and they experienced that passing on of authority from him. And now he's saying to them again, I want you to understand, I'm empowered. I'm, I have authority to do exactly what I'm doing. <clears throat> Jesus came near and spoke to them. I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. God has authenticated me absolutely. The devil, when he tempted Jesus, tried early in his ministry to say, Jesus, if you'll just back off, I'll let you have control over everything in this world. And Jesus didn't go for that, did he? He understood there was so much more than just here and now. And now he is making it clear that he has gone beyond that. And in heaven now, he has been empowered with all power and all abilities. He says, now, based on my authority, I authorize you. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
Go make disciples. Go be proactive. John Maxwell is uh, one of those leadership folks that talks a lot about uh, prince, basic principles of leadership and guidance. Stephen Covey is one too. He talks about being proactive. That was one of the first places that I heard that word proactive really being uh, used a lot. Proactive means to anticipate what's coming and to move toward it. Proactive is not reactive. It's not, you don't wait until uh, you have a wreck to say, I need to watch how I'm driving. You watch how you're driving and you say, you know, but for the grace of God, I could have had an accident back there. I've got to sharpen up. I've got to pay attention to signs. I've got to watch the other guy. I've got to do that's proactive when we think ahead and do those things. Jesus says, go and make disciples. I'm authorizing you to do that. And he says, here he breaks down a barrier that is, is going to take the disciples a while yet to really understand. But he says, of all nations. I like the fact that we can go into this commission and see of all nations. And we can go all the way back to the beginning covenant with Abraham and see how God says to Abraham, through you and your people, I will bless everyone the whole world for through you they will come to know me he gives them two particular tasks to focus on baptizing and teaching baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit teaching them to obey everything that i have commanded you baptize call for a commitment show and tell don't be satisfied just to tell folks. Challenge them. Call them into a response to the truth of God's will for their lives. Call themselves into a response to God's forgiveness and their need for that forgiveness. Call people to respond to that. Baptism being one of the earliest rituals that we've do as a Christian church to initiate someone into the family of God. Baptism. Saying to the world, I am with God. I am God's person. Whether it be a child or an adult, that baptism is a way to say, I am associated and affiliated and connected with God. Then teaching. Teaching them to not just to know things, but to have the knowledge and the insight to be able to take that knowledge and turn it into actions. That's what we saw last week in James. Uh, you know, show me your works, uh, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Powerful words that we need to understand. Teaching. Teaching involves not only sharing, but mentoring. And that's what the church is about. Churches are called to teach and to mentor, to be a school for young Christians, to be a school for all Christians, for we're all, we all have things that we're learning and growing in in our spiritual lives and faith. And lastly, Jesus puts the icing on the cake. He says, look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of of this present age what a promise Jesus says I'm not going anywhere folks I'm still going to be right here he was sending the Holy Spirit to live in their hearts and lives to guide them and teach them and to direct them and empower them he was promising them his support and he says all I ask is that you don't try to do it all on your own, but you simply learn to trust, seek my will, and allow me to work through you to touch the lives of those who, like yourself, I love deeply and dearly. What a wonderful commission. What a wonderful Lord. 
who would see our need to have focus and who would help us to clarify those things that are most important. We started off with the greatest commandments. We ended up with the Great Commission. And all in between serves to help us to know God by knowing ourselves. Maybe I should say by knowing ourselves, by knowing God. It works both ways, doesn't it? God bless you in this week ahead. I hope you have a wonderful week. And I hope you can apply this great commission, this wonderful calling that you have by sharing that good news in faith, in word, and in action this week ahead. God bless you.